about t-shirts or shirts, I remember wearing also a shirt that I didn't know really what it meant. I was, I was in, I think I was in Pretoria, and um, a big guy walked up to me and says, so when were you in the Parabats? And I said, no, I, I, <laughs> I wasn't in the Parabats. And, and let me tell you, it's not a good thing to wear a t-shirt or a Parabat if you haven't been in the Parabats. So you've been careful about some of these shirts we wear. Well, happy Valentine's Day. I am, um, I'm gonna take, the, this information is from the Adventures of Odyssey. And um, so if I'm wrong, I do stand under correction. But St. Valentine was martyred because he married people in a time in the Roman Empire when marriage was disallowed because the emperor wanted men to go to war. And St. Valentine made a very good case. He said, let me tell you this, men will fight a lot harder when they're fighting for their family. And I guess like so many of these traditions, I don't know if that really is the story, but it is a wonderful story of St. Valentine. What I trust I'm gonna to share today is something that I believe will set your marriage, your love life on fire like nothing else. And if you're not married, and if you're single, it'll set you on a pathway to love that would make St. Valentine very proud. Before I get there, I just want to say that I want to reiterate, we've spoken a little bit about this Wednesday mail, about celebrating on Sunday. There's something of a rhythm of grace that we as elders really want to witness to and become an example of. Rhythm of Grace is a wonderful name. It's Tando's name for his um, drumming school. But there's something about when we wrestle through the scriptures that we, we, we fight, certainly as elders being witnesses and, and trying to set something of an example for people that we should find some kind of rhythm of grace so that we can own this life. So this Sunday, this first day of the week is a day that we celebrate. I mean, it, 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 you know, when, the, when those disciples saw Jesus resurrected from the dead, they were, their whole life was completely changed. And they said, and everything was changed on that day. And they celebrated. And so when we come before here and we start worshiping, it, it, it's just a dynamic that sets up our week like we have no idea. It's like, this is something, when we come into church today, and I love... I, I walked in, into my, in my seat here. Those scriptures that you have, those messages that you have on your seat today, I want to say with absolute conviction that that is a word direct from God for you. I decided when I was standing there to walk to this chair because I knew I saw these things on the chair. I know how this works. I said, I, I know which chair. I want this chair. I got to that chair. The scripture on my chair was perfect love drives out all fear. Let me tell you, I fasted five days once when I was going and making a huge decision. On that last, on the fifth day, when I was waiting to hear on God, a lady who didn't know who I was fasting, a lady who wouldn't have had my number, phoned me up and said, Mark, I woke up this morning and there was a scripture on my heart for you. Perfect love drives out all fear. And I couldn't have a better message on Valentine's Day for me and my wife. And it's the, it's, we can, we can kind of say there's no coincidence in that, but I've walked long enough to Jesus that know, to know that this magnificent God honors when we make his day when we make him number one and we come celebrate on his day he will honor you and he'll honor every single one of you as you come and, and receive his word today and he'll take you further in him and there's nothing that compares to that I tell, by, by you coming here and making jesus first on the first day of the week you're setting up your week for success and and that should and the more we do that the more we start to find this life that jesus promises so happy Valentine's Day to you today. It's a good day. And, and when you get this message, as I told my wife this morning, I didn't tell her, I said, it's Valentine's Day every day in my house, which is a cop-out on not getting flowers, but, but really, truly, truly it is. So we in the Red Letters series, the scripture on my heart, Jesus replied, and this is from John 12, 23, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But, it's, 
but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it, and those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. That's from the New Living Translation. Thanks. Americans got it up there. We're sitting here today because we are followers of Jesus. And when we follow Him authentically, in other words, when we follow Him with an integrous heart, and, and I could just stop there, right there. But Jeremiah speaks about our hearts that are deceitful beyond all things. When, you know, we can just pass over these scriptures. When I follow Him authentically, I begin to do what He does. And Jesus gives us life He gave his life for us, and in doing this, he inspired a discipleship movement of sacrificial people who likewise give up their lives for the sake of others. And the, and the majority of early disciples were martyred for their faith. And like Stephen, I don't know this, but like Stephen, I have very little doubt that they went to their death with great peace. Probably not joy in their pain, but certainly joy in their heart, in expectation of glory. And as the scripture says that we find life, when like a seed, we die. And in our death, we create a dynamic that produces a plentiful harvest of lives for others. When we die like a seed, create a dynamic in our life that creates life. The whole Bible and all of life is summed up by our love for God which is expressed for our love for others and that we would love others like Christ did and we do that by making disciples. You know I've spoken so much about this. I read the Bible and I've read the Bible through the last 10, 12 years. I'm not sure how long it is. And many people, here's the book, it's standing right here. And you can take this book, and what we, you hear at, at City Gate experience, you experience as elders our response to this book. And you can respond to this book in many ways. You can take this book and you can use it to abuse. You can take this book and you can Bible bash people. You can take this book and you can create amazing life. But one of the great faith dynamics is God doesn't necessarily try and control the use of His book. It's, it's because He loves faith so much. He's prepared to allow people to trample on this book, to tear it up and to burn it. He's not afraid of that. Because He so appreciates faith. He so glorifies Himself in putting his life and his book on the line. There would be many who would be offended by me even dropping their Bible right now. It's, he put his whole body on the line, he puts his book on the line, and he does that to reveal what's really in our heart. He spoke in parables, because he said, I'm not going to make it too easy for you, I want to know how much you really love me. Not because he's trying to test us, because he's trying to show us up because he's so passionate about love. He so loves creating a dynamic where the love story is absolutely, he's, he is like there's no romantic movie that compares to the one he's just put for you and I. And so when I walk, when I go through this Bible, like Christoph said the Westminster Catechism was written so that people who go through the Bible can try and take something of this incredible love story, the, the dimensions of it, the scope of it, the width and depth of it, and put it into some kind of language that makes some kind of sense for people who haven't had the opportunity to, to have years and years of going through this book. Knowing that people can take this book and abuse it. And so the skillful 
art of, of, of ministry is to take this information and make it accessible for us. And so for, when, for me and for Mark's daughter, I say, well, if Jesus has, has asked us to make disciples, I ask myself these seven questions. And, and it's kind of my Westminster Catechism, catechism which they... And certainly when I was in school, we had a few catechisms which we would say all the time just so we could understand it. And forgive me if I say this all the time, but the first thing I ask is, am I living completely in the light with every area of my life, my life and my heart surrounded to, surrendered to Christ? Am I actually saved? In the prayer meeting, we underestimate that miraculous position, the miraculous decision of salvation. It's so completely radical for you to actually confess Christ and honestly give Him your whole heart. But it is your whole heart. Am I totally surrendered to Christ? Am I eating my daily bread? Am I feeding on the Word of God and falling increasingly in love with Christ and radically surrendering, surrendering to His ways over mine? Am I serving my fellow man, serving my local church and my surrounding community? Am I prayerful and processing all of my life decisions through a lifestyle of continuous interaction with my Father? Am I being generous with all of my life and my words and my time and my skills and my resources? Am I a brick in the wall submitted to those teachers who are a bit ahead of me and submitted in heart to them with very intimate relationships with those alongside me and investing in those below me? And am I being a witness to others where other people want what I have? Because I have created rhythms of grace in my life as a response to the Holy Spirit of this book that becomes so attractive because every response of mine is so in line with the Spirit. So when I mourn well, I'm, when I mourn, I mourn well. When I celebrate, I'm the first open on the dance floor. When I'm running into, into, into the fire, I trust I'm running to the fire. Am I there yet? No. But that is our catechism. That's certainly my catechism in response to this book. And I just say those things because today my message is to burn the ships and we'll get to we'll get to that we'll, 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 we'll finish with an amazing song and response but it rests on this first statement am I completely in the light have I given myself have I totally surrendered to Christ I say that because if that hasn't happened forget the other six things we can't even talk about those other six things until you've got this first thing right. The reality of the first question and my answer to that will completely dictate how I respond to every single one of those things. And a good reason why we spend so much time in the Gospels and what is so evident in the red letters is that Jesus was completely radical. I love the fact that I start my Bible reading plan in the Gospels every year. It's a good place to start. There's something about the red letters that's just so uncompromising. It's so completely radical. As C.S. Lewis says, you can say to you, can, you, can, you can't say that uh, uh, this is just like some suggestive good language. You can't say that, that uh, you know, the Bible is when you look at what Jesus said, he's either a lord, he's lunatic, or he's a liar. But he can't, you've got to choose either of three of those, those options. Jesus does not look kindly on half-hearted, lukewarm Christianity. In fact, it revolts him so much that he spits it out. We are either going to the death or there really is no Christianity at all. I remember going to a Bloemfontein conference early on in my walk and sharing a room with someone who became and still is one of my closest friends. He's a good Portuguese fisherman, Ralph Quintus. We shared a room. We just had one of those moments. And I phoned him this week and I said, do you remember that moment? He says he never forgets. It is amazing that you never forget those God moments. We were sitting opposite each other and we said that we asked ourselves, are we prepared to die for this? At that same conference, I saw a guy that I used to play hockey with. I spent 12 of my years after school playing hockey. It was one of my idols just to become a professional in any sport possible. 
And I saw one of the guys I used to play hockey with at this conference, and he was quite shocked to see me because he was a, he was a very good player. I was captain of the side, and I got really upset with him when he told me in those days that he needed to go to church on Sundays. I said, you don't need to be at church. You need to be at the hockey field in our team at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. And then he was completely shocked to see me at this conference. You see, part of my surrender to Christ was to actually give up some of those things that had become so part of my identity. Asking myself, am I actually prepared to die? There was something of a dynamic in those conferences where, where, where they really got us asking the deep questions so that they could shift people like me and many others out of this world that we got so entangled in and take us and rip us out of it by putting us into a journey that was far more, far more life. I can guarantee you if I went back to that old days pub where I spent night after night after night, I would still see those same guys sitting in the same place, having their beers, talking about the same things which happened 25 years ago when they were in the prime of their life. Thank you, Jesus, you ripped me out of that. And I was so in there. I was organizing I don't even want to tell you what I was organizing in that thing. And God ripped me out of there as he's ripped each and, other, each and every one of us out of a life of meaninglessness. And so when I think of this man, Raul, I'm reminded of a scripture that says, when Jesus sees Nathan, Nathan or Nathaniel the first time, and he says, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. What a, do we, do we, I mean, I, when I think of Raul, I think of, of, of that kind of guy. Because, because you, you've heard me say this, and, and this is kind of like Sean says, one of my muscle messages. There's no pill for your will. You can't go and take a pill for your will. Christianity is most defined by decision. It's actually not most. I'm going to switch it around. It's most defined by love, but love is most defined by decision. The foundation of God's love for us is a decision. Following Christ is, the, is, is a decision of radical faith. And we make that decision and we continue to make radical decisions every day. It doesn't happen once, it happens every day. So put your cross on daily. Christianity is exceptionally spiritual, but it is completely practical as well. It's decisions that involve real sacrifice, decisions that require your will. And, and, I'm, and I'm hopping on this because my experience of the last five years of sometimes exhaustive pastoral ministry is I've been increasingly conv convinced when dealing with many people that we've wasted so much time they just don't want to change. And I often think of Raul because you see, and so many of these people are very spiritual people. Brother, pastor, prophetic words. You know, Raul, like I think Nathaniel, listen, he's the most probably unprophetic person you'd ever see. He's probably one of the most unspiritual people. He's just like, he's like one of those, almost like dull, like he's not at all. He's not, I mean, I could only say that he's, because I love him and he's a friend. I'm probably illustrating that a bit more to make the point. But when he decided to follow Christ, he gave all of his heart. Every single decision that that man made from the day he decided to follow Christ was to follow him with all of his heart. And yet, we see so many people Unbeliever, pastor, brother, I've got a pro slain in the spirit, falling all over. But are you?
are your daily choices in line with that of Christ? And I suppose it's no surprise that that is so much a part of our life. When I spent probably five to six hours yesterday listening to, I thought, some of the best theater and best TV that I've watched in, in many months. I watched the impeachment trial with incredibly skillful lawyers on both sides. Defending Trump on the one hand, defending, prosecuting Trump on the other. And I watched how these skillful men could sway you either way. And what they were really doing is that they actually decided already what they wanted to decide. And they were just making the facts suit their argument. And let me tell you, both sides were particularly persuasive. And I think this is kind of what we do. It's this humanist, is it a humanist movement? It's, it's, is that okay for you? It's like, I'm going to take the, whatever truth I want to find, and I'm going to make that truth suit me. And that's good for you, and your truth's good for you, but, but where's truth? Where's the real truth? And I say that because, not, I don't even go down that trail, but, but I think it's significant because that's happening at the top courts of certainly the world, where that display of deceit is actually impacting you and me. And so we've got to be wise to this reality is that are you actually going to come, when we say we're going to follow Christ, are you going to look at him square in the eyes and are you going to be like Nathaniel and have a heart that honestly asks the right questions? And then surrenders to real truth. There's only one truth. It's Jesus Christ. I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life. And nobody comes to the Father except me. And until we radically follow him, until we give all of us, go all of ourselves to him, there's no truth at all. And so we are here today for one simple reason. We are here today and where, and where you are today because of the decisions you've made. And these, this, these decisions are significant. And they're so significant because ultimately your decisions that have most significance are those decisions that deal with your biggest problem and your biggest problem and our biggest problem is sin. You know, you read the scripture and Jesus speaks about death. I mean, no one wants to speak about death. I mean, I, I, I kind of, I love this. I feel this is my message because I've grown up with this name, Slaughter. So maybe I was one of those sacrificial guys, the priest that stood at the front, and my ancestors were the guys that killed all those animals. And if you've ever seen one of our, I don't know if you've witnessed one of our uh, sacrifices that still happen, often in some of our black tribes, Killing the goat. It's just brutal. I mean, it's, it's chilling. But there was something of a graphic illustration of, do you understand that what you, how bad your sin is? Do you understand that, that, that we need to shed blood and hear that oxen screaming for its life? Have you ever seen that? You've seen those cows know when they're going to the death. Before that night has even got out, they sense it in the spiritual realm. And there's something of a picture of of that that helps us understand how bad our sin actually is. How, how, how deep our problem really is. And so, so fundamental to understanding this process of death and having a willful decision that we've got to make to die is actually realizing this full extent of the problem we have. Like we have a serious problem, it's called sin. And secondly, it's having a real revelation of the love of our Father. And the grace that comes out of understanding how much our Father loves, His perfect love drives out all fear. The thing that fears, that most people fear is actually their death. I mean, 
And really, it is the kind of worst thing that can happen to you if you don't know Jesus especially. And his perfect love drives out all fear. When I was uh, going through Africa with three of my friends, we rocked up in, at, at Bujigali Falls, which is the, it's at the Lake Victoria, at the, at the source of the Nile River. And we met Ian Bailey, who is the Mohican guy who lives with, with a Mohican from Zimbabwe. And he took us on bodyboards down grade five rapids. And before every rapid, he looked at us and he just said, we're gonna die. And we dived in and you just didn't know where you were for the next three, 30 seconds. And there was something so beautiful about that story because it's, it's a bit like that with our life of Christ. He was, I mean, you know, in Acts they said, they, everyone was terrified to join them, but, but, but people were joining them every day. There was this, it was this sense of actually, I want to be there, but it's pretty scary. And it's exactly like that rapid. You just wanted to be going down the rapid, but you knew it was very, very scary. And you just hoped you were going to get out alive. But boy, was it a wild adventure. And so there's this radical invitation to death. But it's in that place that you find life like you never experienced before because fear is gone. So we get radically saved and the first little step of obedience is we get baptized. And, and we go and, and I got baptized out of Joe Cool in front of Joe Cool's there in the, in the sea and, and I went down and I invited my friends. I said, come in. Come and see, come and witness what something's happened in my heart. I'm dying to that old life and I'm coming back. I'm dead and I'm coming up a new person. Resurrected like Jesus, my Savior. And like Nicodemus, we actually have a few problems with this. How is it possible Nicodemus said, Jesus, how is it possible I'm, I'm 55 years old? How is it possible that after 50 years, or 55 years, I must die and I must be reborn? And I guess we struggle with that because we just are so blinded to how we have been completely indoctrinated with absolutely everything that we've ever learned about anything, let alone our bloodline, that, con that confuses us and all those ancestors that have kind of put some stuff in us that Pinky kind of described. And I'm going to get to that now because that's massively significant what she just said. Paul says, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When, when, we, when we come to Jesus, he leaves no stone unturned. The problem, and, and he's gracious to us, because let me tell you, it, it's such a radical salvation that it's going to take a long journey for us to totally outwork what God, what's actually happened to us in our heart. But can I say this? Every year, you've got to look back, and you've got to say, I'm not the same person at the end of this year as I was at the beginning of this year. Twenty years ago, I know exactly where I was when I said, I won't give you the exact language I used because that was in an unredeemed state, but I said basically I want to be ruthlessly efficient and I want to have and I wanted to be unafraid of anything. It's probably taken twenty years for me to get to a place where I can say no. Because if you're going to become ruthlessly efficient, you've got to learn how to say no. And so, what, and in order to say no, you have to have your identity fashioned by Jesus. We started homeschooling our kids. Please, I'm not. I'm not trying to put this on anyone that you have to homeschool. I'm just using this as my testimony. 
I, tell you, I come from an education background where I never have considered homeschooling. Never. I would never be able to take a decision of faith. To, I would never be able to take a decision of homeschooling without a faith that Jesus Christ was calling us into the, into this path. But what I've realized. that between homeschooling and coronavirus, 20 years later, God is still dismantling me completely. He's dismantling the whole world at the moment with coronavirus because every single idol has been blown up. Nobody knows what's going on. You can't, everything you thought and every, everything everyone else thought they could trust in, they cannot. Everything's failed. There's no government, there's no doctor, nobody knows what's going on. Homeschooling has affronted every single one of my pride, my prejudice, everything I learned from this age. Between my bloodline and, and between what my school and my experience and everything of life has taught me a whole lot of things. And like we even saw in that trial yesterday, until your faith is tested, you don't know what you don't know. to Jesus he takes everything that you thought you knew about everything and like a plumb line you bring that to this book and if your life doesn't line up with this book you realize you have a problem I'll tell you what that problem is it's sin and what Jesus says is now I'm going to help you deal with your greatest problem. We're going to put it to death. The whole book from Genesis to Revelation is a story of a loving father that knows our biggest issue. And everything in here is helping us deal with our biggest issue. Adam and Eve sin, he gives them a covering. Like the Israelites, we are enslaved. We are enslaved to sin. Think of that. Think of an Israelite waking up every day, being told what to do. Today you're going here. At this time you're going to eat. At that time you're going to... And don't think you're going to get paid. And if you're feeling tired, you're just going to carry on. And when you think you can say something, you can't say something because you will work. And when you complain, just like Moses complained to them, I'm going to put double the amount of work on you. And don't think that you can ever get away because you won't because I've got you. Don't, has, has, have things really changed? You know what I know as an entrepreneur? I remember going to university for the first time and realizing, oh wow, no one's, no one's telling me what to do for the first time in my life. I had started smoking in the attic at school. I remember pulling out a pack of cigarettes and sitting in my bed and starting to test the fact that I actually could make decisions for myself. What I realized as an entrepreneur is you start working, but you don't have a boss. When we started our business, we had, we had, we had two business partners, so when one guy was late, let me tell you, you knew about it. We, we, we were very brutal with each other, and, and we knew all our weaknesses, and that was ironed out in our first big meeting, which was really profound. 
But seven years after that, then I can move to Durban to set up this business, and I was free. I could pretty much do what I wanted to do. And you see, with freedom came responsibility. But what I soon started to realize is that people actually don't want to make decisions because people and myself from that age had never made a decision before. From this young age, we've been told, this is when you go, that's how you go, this is the time that the bell goes, after that you're going to do this, this is what you're going to study, that's where you're going to go. And actually, you've never learned to make a decision. So what happens when we come to the, to the church, we come to this Bible, and God wants you to make a decision, no one makes a decision because you haven't made decisions for the whole of your life. Why do we have movements that become cults is because people don't want to make a decision. They don't want to read this for themselves because they've never made a decision. Because we've lived a life of disempowerment. And, and it's quite... And you know why? Because we're scared. Because we live in a world system like I just saw for six hours last night that will do anything to disempower people so that they and the, 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 the people in the know will help you make decisions rather than putting a responsibility on you to make those decisions. You see, this radical lover never needs to defend himself. He's put himself out there. He says, now you decide. I'm not going to make you, but I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you to the most radical life you're ever going to live in your life, but you are going to make that decision. And let me tell you, for most people, that sends them like it did for me when I walked down the aisle and I had to, and I was making a massive decision. It was like I was like that guy at the Comrades Marathon who couldn't get over the line. I had to get carried over by my friends because when you really got to look square in the eyes and make a decision for yourself, it undoes you because we've been disempowered by a system of the world. It's the enemy's territory from a young age. He took them out of the desert. He took them out of miraculously, freed them from slavery as he's freed every single one of us. He takes them, he took us through the Red Sea. He's done miracles in all of your lives. And then he takes us through this desert where he begins to teach us in amazing ways. He says, you need a bit of manna from heaven. You need quail. I know you need quail. He took them from water hole to water hole. He gave them cloud by day because it was so hot in the desert. He gave them fire by night because at night they were probably a bit chilly. He then said, I'm going to take you up a mountain. What did he do? What suppose he says, Moses, go up the mountain. I'm going to just help you deal with your sin. What's the first thing that people did when Moses was gone? They made a cough. Because human beings hate to worship something that they cannot see and cannot control. People do not like to have faith in something they cannot see. Make me a calf. I can't see Moses anymore. Can't see Mark anymore. Where's Mark? I need to make a decision. No, you don't. You need to go to the Father in heaven and ask him to speak to you. He's right there. Knock and I'll open the door. And they make this golden calf. Moses comes down and he breaks the tablets, goes back up for 80 days, comes back and gives these tablets. These tablets, I mean, how many, this is the thing. We say that in our church, God first. I mean, how many guys, and I'm sure you've got them friends that says, oh, I'm, I'm, I follow the Ten Commandments. I mean, I just, one of the amount of conversations I've had with people, I follow the Ten Commandments, I'm a good person. You know, if, if, if I was really wanting to not be gentle, I would say, let me tell you, my friend, you haven't even got halfway past the first commandment. Because the first commandment is to love the God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you aren't even close to that first one. And I can see it because your fruit is no fruit. God first is our first value here because until you've made this radical, radical decision, forget everything else. It's a waste of time. Until you've completely died. Can't be more dead than dead, but have you died? And as I say, you can make it a slow death of crucifixion or just make it a quick death and take a bullet to yourself and make it quick. And the secret to a most amazing marriage, to me back to the first comment, is radical death. If you had to ask me one word for a successful marriage, it's coming by. So that Christ can flow through you and you can be a blessing to each other. It's easy to be married to Jesus. The problem is we're not. We're married to somebody who's fighting Jesus. Mark. And he 
gives us a tabernacle. And he says, right guys, I know you want to do lost things. I know you need your food. I know you need shade. I know you need warmth. I know you want to take over this promised land. I've got land here. I know you've got lots of things to do, but we've got a big problem here. And right in the middle of your camp, I'm going to help you deal with this problem. It's called the law. So I'm going to give you the law, 10 little commandments. What that's going to do, it's going to teach you what's really in your heart and tell you your big problem. You see, we hate the law, but what the, where does the law land? It lands right in Jesus. It lands right in grace. Once a year, or, or, or once a week, whatever it was, come and bring your atonement, bring your sacrifice. That blood, watch that cow die for you. Watch him squeal as he dies. And we're going to throw that blood down. You're going to go through the labor. You're going to cleanse of your sin. We're going to go into the holy place where there's light and we light our candle every day where we, where we eat the bread of life every day where those priests went every day with the bread of life where the incense is our prayers that go out every day and once a year the priest is going to go on the day of atonement and he's going to take the blood and he's going to sprinkle that place on one day of the year and then he's going to finish that service by taking all of your sins and putting it on the scapegoat confessing it on this goat one goat's dead, the other goat's into the wilderness so you realize that I'm going to deal with your greatest problem is sin and that is going to set you free because freedom is what we most desire and i want to say this i think the worst thing and i've experienced this recently and it's just a reminder the worst thing that can happen to any human the worst condition is this feeling of guilt i don't know if there's a worse human condition than feeling the, the, the weight of guilt i remember born in school remember we had done something wrong, waiting for that week to get jacked, waiting for the feeling of I am guilty and it kills you. And there are so many people, and maybe you're watching today, and you know what it feels because you've done something wrong. Most people land up in psychological institutions because of adultery, I think. I've heard. The point is, when you start to sin, you begin to die a very, very painful death. And what Jesus does is he takes that worst thing that's happened to you and he, and he takes it on. And, it's, and that tabernacle was a prophetic picture of the blood of Christ that would cleanse us one day of all, of all of our sins. It was a shadow of what was to come. such a powerful desire. This is why so many of Hollywood's greatest movies and books are about freedom. And freedom is found in the very place that you don't want to go. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. If you guys can get that video, we're going to finish with a song and a video that really hits me in, in my core. I love these guys, they're super cool, I call them my mates prophetically. They carry something so beautiful, they carry such freedom. And I want you to listen to the song and close your eyes, and if you're online, you can download, it's for King and Country, Burn the Ships. And I want you to take this message, and take this song, and I trust Burn the baggage. Burn all that stuff that stopped you walking into your inheritance. Burn it for once and for all. Burn it. This amazing lady is hungry for Jesus. Most people need somebody else to come and deliver them.
when you're hungry for Jesus, you can go into your bedroom, into your thing, and you can cry out to him all night. And the God of, of eternity will hear your prayer. And like in Psalm 18, he says, I'll come and rescue you, and I'll rip those demons out of you. And my friends, don't under, we, the, the, the bloodline curses that come through are very real. And that's why we're so militant about this. That's why we need to burn our ships. If you can play that song now, if you can close our eyes, open your eyes and watch the video. Sorry, open your eyes and watch this song. Don't close your eyes. Watch the video. The video is good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to mute it on Facebook because this is a commercial song. At the moment, Facebook hears that this commercial, they'll mute us. So what I and open up another, open up YouTube, go burn the ships for king and country, and you can, okay, Sean, put it on. Go for it, guys.
last week, Walter spoke about the vine and the vine dresser cutting those things that draw no fruit. And his response to the great lover Jesus of his soul is to go, as the song says, to that dark place to conquer his fear, to go to the place that he doesn't want to go and allow the beautiful surgeon to cut that stuff away so that he can fully live. Amen.